When you were talking about intelligence, you mentioned multipartite quantum entanglement. Mm -hmm. So high level question first is, uh, what do you think is intelligence? When you think about quantum mechanical systems and you observe some kind of computation happening in them, what do you think is intelligent about the kind of computation the universe is able to do? A small, small inkling of which is the kind of computation the human brain is able to do. I, I would say like intelligence and computation aren't quite the same thing. I think that the universe is very much, you know, doing a, a quantum computation. If you had access to all the degrees of freedom, you could, and a very, very, very large quantum computer with many, many, many qubits, uh, let's say a few qubits per uh, Planck volume, right? Um, which is more or less the pixels we have, uh, then you, you'd be able to simulate the whole universe, right? Uh, on a on a sufficiently large quantum computer, assuming you're looking at a finite volume, of course, of the universe. Um, I think that, at least to me, intelligence is the, you know, I go back to cybernetics, right? The ability to perceive, predict, and control our world. But really it's, nowadays it seems like a lot of intelligence um, we use is more about compression, right? Mm -hmm. It's about um, it's about operationalizing information theory, right? In information theory, you have the notion of entropy of a distribution or a system. And entropy tells you that you need this many bits uh, to encode this distribution or this subsystem if you had the most optimal code. Mm -hmm. And AI, at least the way we you, we do it today for LLMs and for quantum uh, is is very much trying to minimize uh, relative entropy between our models of the world and the world, distributions from the world. And so we're learning, we're searching over the space of computations to process the world, to find that compressed representation that has distilled all the variance and noise and entropy, right? Um, and originally, I, I came to quantum machine learning from the study of black holes because the entropy of black holes is very interesting. In a sense, they're physically the most dense objects in the universe. You can't pack more information spatially any more densely than a black hole. And so I was wondering, how do black holes actually encode information? What is their compression code? And so that got me into the space of algorithms to search over space of quantum uh, codes. Um, and uh, it got me actually into also, how do you acquire quantum information the, from the world, right? So something I've worked on, uh, this is public now, is quantum analog digital conversion. So how do you capture information from the real world in superposition and not destroy the superposition, but digitize for a quantum mechanical computer uh, information from the real world? Um, and so if you have an ability to capture quantum information and search over learned representations of it, now you can learn compressed representations that may have some useful information in their latent representation, right? Um, and I think that many of the problems facing our civilization are actually beyond this, this complexity barrier, right? I mean, the greenhouse effect is a quantum mechanical effect, right? Chemistry is quantum mechanical. Um, you know, nuclear physics is quantum mechanical. A lot of biology and, 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 protein folding and so on is affected by quantum mechanics. And so unlocking an ability to augment human intellect with quantum mechanical computers and quantum mechanical AI seemed to me like a fundamental capability for civilization that we, we needed to develop. Um, so I spent several years doing that. Um, but over time, I kind of grew weary of the, the timelines that we're starting to look like nuclear fusion. So one high level question I can ask is, 
maybe by way of definition, by way of explanation, what is a quantum computer and what is uh, quantum machine learning? Hmm. So a quantum computer really is a quantum mechanical system over which we have sufficient control and it can maintain its quantum mechanical state. Mm -hmm. And quantum mechanics is how nature behaves at the very small scales when things are very small or very cold. And it's actually more fundamental than probability theory. So we're used to things being this or that, uh, but we're not used to thinking in superpositions because uh, well, our brains can't uh, can't do that. So we, we have to translate the quantum mechanical world to say linear algebra to grok it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that translation is exponentially inefficient on average. You have to represent things with very large matrices. But really you can make a quantum computer out of many things, right? And we've seen all sorts of players, you know, from neutral atoms, trapped ions, superconducting metal, um, photons in, at different frequencies. I think you can make a quantum computer out of many things. But to, to me, the thing that was really interesting was both quantum machine learning was about understanding the quantum mechanical world with quantum computers, so embedding the physical world into AI representations. And quantum computer engineering was embedding AI algorithms into the physical world. So this bi-directionality of embedding physical world into AI, AI into the physical world, the sim symbiosis between physics and AI, really that's the sort of core of my quest really, uh, even to this day after quantum computing. It's still in this sort of um, journey to merge really physics and AI fundamentally. So quantum machine learning is a way to do machine learning on a uh, representation of nature that is, you know, stays true to the quantum mechanical aspect of nature. Yeah, it's learning quantum mechanical representations. That would be quantum deep learning. Um, alternatively, you can try to do classical machine learning on a quantum computer. I wouldn't advise it because um, you may have some speed ups, but very often the speed ups come with huge costs. Using a quantum computer is very expensive. Why is that? Because you assume the computer is operating at zero temperature, which no physical system in the universe can achieve that temperature. So what you have to do is what I've been mentioning, this quantum error correction process, which is really an algorithmic fridge, right? It's trying to pump entropy out of the system, trying to get it closer to, to zero temperature. And when you do the calculations of how many resources it would take to say do deep learning on a quantum computer, classical deep learning, uh, it's it, there's just a, such a huge overhead, it's not worth it. It's like thinking about shipping something across a city using a rocket and going to orbit and back. It doesn't make sense, just use uh, a you know, delivery truck, right? What kind of stuff can you figure out, can you predict, can you understand with quantum deep learning that you can't with deep learning. So incorporating quantum mechanical systems into the into the learning process. I think that's a great question. I mean, fundamentally it's any system that has sufficient uh, quantum mechanical uh, correlations that are very hard to capture for classical representations, then there should be an advantage for a quantum mechanical representation over a purely classical one. The question is which systems have sufficient correlations that are very quantum, uh, but is also uh, which systems are still relevant to industry, that's a big question. You know, people are leaning towards chemistry, uh, nuclear physics. Uh, um, I've worked on actually processing inputs from quantum sensors, right? If you have a network of quantum sensors, they've captured a quantum mechanical image of the world and how to post-process that, that becomes a sort of quantum form of machine perception. And so for example, uh, Fermilab has a project exploring detecting dark matter with these quantum sensors. Mm -hmm. And to me, uh, that's in alignment with my quest to understand the universe ever since I was a child. And so someday I hope that we can have very large networks of quantum sensors that help us 
um, peer into the earliest parts of the the universe, right? For example, the LIGO is a quantum sensor, right? It's just a very large one. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would say quantum machine perception uh, simulations, right? Grokking quantum simulations, so similar to AlphaFold, right? AlphaFold understood the probability distribution over configurations of proteins. You can understand quantum distributions over configurations of electrons uh, more efficiently with quantum machine learning. You co-authored a paper titled A Universal Training Algorithm for Quantum Deep Learning uh, that involves backprop with a Q. Very well done, sir. Very well done. How does it work? Is, it, is there some interesting aspects you can just mention uh, on how kind of, you know, backprop and some of these things we know for classical machine learning transfer over to the, mm -hmm. uh, the quantum machine learning. Yeah, that was that was a that was a funky paper. That was one of my first papers in in quantum deep learning. Everybody was saying, "Oh, I think deep learning is going to be sped up by quantum computers." And I was like, "Well, the best way to predict the future is to invent it." So, here's a 100-page paper. <laughs> Have fun. Um essentially you you know, quantum computing is usually you embed uh, reversible operations into a quantum computation. Mm -hmm. And so the trick there was to do a feed forward operation and do what we call a phase kick, but really it's just a force kick. You just kick the system uh, with a certain force that is you know, proportional to your loss function that you, you wish to optimize. And then by performing uncomputation, you start with a superpositions over a superposition over parameters, right? Which is pretty funky. Now you're not just you don't have just a point for parameters, you have a superposition over many potential yep. parameters, right? Mm -hmm. And our goal is, is to- using phase kicks somehow? Right. To adjust the parameters? Because phase kicks emulate uh, having uh, the parameter space be like a, a particle in n dimensions. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to get the Schrodinger equation, Schrodinger d dynamics in the loss landscape of the neural network. Mm -hmm. Right, and so you do an algorithm to induce this phase kick, which you know involves a feed forward, a kick, and then when you uncompute the feed forward, then all the errors in these phase kicks and these forces back propagate and hit each one of the parameters throughout the layers. And if you alternate this with an emulation of kinetic energy, then it's kind of like a particle moving in n dimensions, a quantum particle. Um, and the advantage in principle would be that it can tunnel through the landscape um, and find new optima that would have been difficult for stochastic optimizers. Um, but again, this is kind of a theoretical thing. And in practice, uh, with at least the current architectures for quantum computers that we have planned, uh, you know, such algorithms would be extremely expensive to run. So maybe this is a good place to ask the difference between the different fields that you've had a toe in. Mm. So mathematics, physics, engineering, and also, you know, entrepreneurship. Like the different layers of the stack. Mm. I think a lot of the stuff you're talking about here is a little bit on the math side, maybe physics, almost working in mm -hmm. theory. What's the difference to you between math, physics, engineering, and, uh, you know, make, making a product <laughs> uh, for quantum computing, for quantum machine learning? Yeah, I mean, you know, some of the original team uh, for the TensorFlow Quantum Project, which we started, you know, in school at the University of Waterloo, uh, there was myself, uh, you know, initially I was a, a, a physicist, a mathematician, mathematician, we had a computer scientist, uh, we had mechanical engineer, and then we had a physicist that was experimental primarily. And so putting together teams that are very cross-disciplinary and, and figuring out how to communicate and and share knowledge is really the key to doing this sort of interdisciplinary uh, engineering work. Um, I mean, there is there is a big uh, difference, you know, in, in mathematics, you can explore mathematics for mathematics sake. In physics, you're applying mathematics to understand uh, the world around us. Uh, and in engineering, you're trying, to, you're trying to hack the world, right? You're trying to find how to apply the physics that I know, my knowledge of the world to, to, to do things. Well, in quantum computing in particular, I think there's a, just a lot of limits to engineering. It just seems to be extremely hard. Yeah. 
So there's a lot of value to be uh, exploring quantum computing, quantum machine learning in uh, theory, right. in with, with 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 math. And so I guess one question is, why is it so hard to build a quantum computer? What are our, uh, what's your view of timelines in bringing these ideas to life? Right. I I think that um, you know an overall theme of my company is uh, that we have folks that are, uh, you know, there's a sort of exodus from quantum computing and mm -hmm. we're, we're going to broader physics-based AI that is not quantum. So that gives you a hint. And um, so we should say the name of your company is Extropic. Extropic, that's right. And we do physics-based AI, primarily based on thermodynamics rather than quantum mechanics. But essentially a quantum computer is very difficult to build because you have to induce this sort of zero temperature subspace of information. And the way to do that is by encoding information. You encode a code within a code, within a code, within a code. And so there's a lot of redundancy needed to do this error correction. But ultimately it's a sort of um, algorithmic refrigerator, really. It's just pumping out entropy out of the, the subsystem that is virtual and, and delocalized that represents your quote unquote logical qubits, AKA the, the payload quantum bits in which you actually want to uh, do uh, run your quantum mechanical program. It's very difficult because in order to scale up your quantum computer, you need each component to be of sufficient quality for it to be worth it. Hmm. Because if you try to do this error correction, this quantum error correction process in each quantum bit and your control over them, isn't if it's insufficient, um, uh, it's not worth scaling up. You're actually adding more errors than you remove. And so there's this notion of a threshold where if your quantum bits are of sufficient quality in terms of your control over them, it's actually worth scaling up. And actually in recent years, people have been crossing the threshold and it's starting to be worth it. And so it's just a very long slog of engineering but ultimately it's really crazy to me how much exquisite level of control we have over these systems. It's actually quite crazy. Uh, and we're, people are crossing, you know, they're achieving milestones. It's just, you know, in general, the media always gets ahead, right? Of where the technology is, there's a bit too much hype. It's good for fundraising, but sometimes, you know, it causes winters, right? It's the hype cycle. I'm bullish on quantum computing on a, 10, 15 year time scale, uh, personally, but I think there's other quests that can be done uh, in the meantime. I think it's in good hands right now.